being fearless in your convictions, but listening and, and ideating with each other. It's just people naturally, I think, pull, pull towards you. Yeah, we're doing it this way and it's working, but why would we want to keep doing it that way? There's always a better way of doing it. If innovation can be an activity in daily living, you know, you're going to rewire your brain to not think about the way we were doing it, but the way we could do it. Kevin B. Mahoney is Chief Executive Officer of the University of Pennsylvania Health System, a pillar of the Penn Medicine Enterprise. He leads health system operations spanning six hospitals, 11 multi-specialty centers, and hundreds of outpatient facilities in Philadelphia, Delaware, and New Jersey. We may cure people of cancer, but the civil unrest, the, the, the separation between the haves and the have-nots will continue, and it will not be a happy world. Mahoney joined Penn Medicine in 1996, holding leadership posts for nearly three decades. Before his appointment as CEO in July 2019, he served as Executive Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer of the University of Pennsylvania Health System and as Executive Vice Dean of the Perlman School of Medicine. We need to learn the hospital is not the center of the healthcare delivery system. And we need to learn as an industry how to meet the patient where they are. And increasingly that's virtual. And if we're not working towards those tools, you know, forget about it. Now let's join the conversation as Kevin Mahoney shares his insights into leadership and innovation with host Nathan Bays. Welcome everyone to the Gary Bisbee Show. Nathan Bays here uh, filling in for Gary and we're honored to have Kevin Mahoney as our guest today. Kevin, as, as we said, wish it was under different circumstances with Gary, but we're, we're so glad that you're here and, and um, uh, available to chat with us on the show and talk about your career. Kevin is, is the president and CEO of Penn Medicine. So Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Nathan. As you mentioned, I couldn't wait for Sunday morning for a lot of things. One is I didn't have to go to work. Second was I could always read a, a note from Gary that would inspire me reflecting back on the week and the week forward. So uh, I'll, I'll miss that connection that we had with Gary. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, well look, Kevin, you've had just a, a tremendous career, um, you know, many successes, uh, Penn Medicine, one of the leading academic medical centers, not only in, in the United States, but really in the world. Uh, and we want to cover all of that in, in the show today. But just, you know, before we jump into to that, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up and, and where did you go to school and how did you become interested in, in healthcare? Sure. So I, I grew up just about 25 miles west of uh, Philadelphia out by Valley Forge Park. Large Irish Catholic family. Not enough uh, beds, not enough uh, bathrooms, but great spirit and, and great fun growing up during the 60s and 70s and watching, you know, a generational change and, and, and living through that. Uh, I, we didn't have a whole lot of money. I went to a local state school out in Lancaster County. And that's when I ended up in healthcare, but through a rather circuitous way, which is somewhere between my freshman and sophomore year after, after having been kicked out in my freshman year for bad grades, I was working for a landscaper I fell off my farm tractor under my farm tractor and the farm tractor ran over me and I ended up in the hospital for several months and um, I loved every minute of being in there. I, I couldn't believe everybody in, in nursing, physical therapists, the doctors, of course, but even the person delivering the food, every, all they wanted me to do was get better. And, and I said, this is a environment that I'm very comfortable in. So I pivoted uh, you know, from a ventilator to really wanting to work in, in, in hospitals. Um, unfortunately, I mentioned I was not a very good student. I went back to uh, meet some of my friends. They got me in trouble as a freshman. And uh, I met my wife and, and Pam has kept me on the straight and narrow ever since 1978. So she taught me how to study. She taught me how to apply myself and went on to uh, Temple for my MBA and eventually my doctorate. Tell us a little bit about you know leadership. When, when did you start kind of, you know, progressing into leadership? Did you always have the desire to, to be a leadership, be in leadership position? So we'd love to hear a little bit more about that journey. Yeah, yeah, um, Nathan, it's a great question and not, not one I've reflected on a lot. I will tell you, I think I was always a leader. I didn't recognize it in, in, until, you know, later 
uh, when I, I started my master's preparation and things like that, when people in the class would be looking at me. And I started to say, you know, if if you want to put yourself out there, if you, if you want to think through the issue and not just yap, and, and you really want to contribute and listen, you know, people just naturally follow you. So I, I mentioned I grew up in a large family. You, you know, you had to be a leader because you were one of the oldest kids and you had to look after your younger brothers. And um, through college and things, I, I started to get involved in leadership, but it was really when I, I first went to Temple and again, sitting with people that would be my, my future peers. Um, again, being fearless in your convictions, but listening and, and ideating with each other. It's just people naturally, I think, pull, pull towards you. Talk about, you know, kind of culture, the role of empathy in culture and how you think about, you know, kind of building and perpetuating, you know, a culture among your workforce at, at yeah. Mexico. What you, you hear me talk about if you came to my town halls or, or different things is true north. You know, I, I think the ethos of, of Penn, founded on the creation and dissemination of knowledge, you know, the, the founding of the nation's first hospital 265 years ago, I don't think our true north has changed. And I try to remind everybody why we chose this line of work, why we're here. And, and again, for a mission that I believe is bigger than ourselves, which is taking care of not just the patient today, but also trying to come up with cures and um, disease prevention uh, for the patients in, in, in the future. What I also, though, talk about a lot, and I quote the, uh, the Lincoln movie, um, Daniel uh, Day-Lewis was in it, and he, he said, you know where True North is, and the compass will tell you where True North is. If you look at your compass, go that way. But the compass won't tell you, is there a swamp ahead of you? Is there a mountain ahead of you? You know, true north getting there is sometimes a crooked path. And I try to remind everybody, particularly now with these headwinds we're facing, like this is that momentary swamp. We still know where we have to get to. We have to get there together. Um, so using data, our ethos, our culture of patient first, look out for each other, push push the boundaries because that's what, what Penn Medicine's about. I think that's our true north in our culture. You, you had just started in your role, or relatively recent in your role as as uh, as president and CEO of Penn Medicine when when COVID um, when COVID hit. I mean, so so what were some of the key? First of all, you know, what was that like as a new you know president CEO of of the organization leading through that? And two, what were some of the key lessons that you really learned and took away from that 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 are lasting and meaningful for for yourself and for the organization? Sure. I, I, I think it, it's a leadership lesson. It's probably obvious. But, you know, I, I took over in July and Hahnemann University closed right after that. We had resonance scramble. We had how are we going to deal with the 90,000 emergency room uh, visits that were getting distributed throughout the, the city. Shortly after that, Mercy Hospital to our west announced that they were closing their inpatient services. And then March 6, we had our first inkling of uh, COVID as an impacting um, in the city of Philadelphia. So no matter how much you think you're prepared, you know, you get the, I think these are dramatic curveballs, but there's always something. And that's what I get back to knowing your core values, may, having criteria upon which to make decisions. So uh, we mentioned uh, putting our patients first and looking out for e each other. You know, we started in COVID. How, how are we going to take care of the patients? A great example, when the entire world was, how are we going to get more ventilators? How are we going to create more ICU beds? Our, our team was inventing what's known as COVID watch, which is there, there are a few patients in the ICU. There are a lot of patients with COVID in the community. And how, how do we watch the patients in the community? And, and again, that's, that's leadership by having the right talent. That they look at problems slightly differently. And with COVID Watch, we were able to keep patients out of the hospital, and that turned out to be the best solution. Well, let, let's shift and talk about something more more exciting uh, and, and, and positive, which is, you know, just innovation and in, in what's going on in, in Penn Medicine and also how innovation, you know, the desire to innovate, the desire to be a, you know, kind of a, not just a steward of, of the history of Penn Medicine, but also pushing the boundaries in, in the future. 
you know, at, at a high level, how do you think about, you know, innovation as it relates to your leadership style and leadership focus? And then w- would love to talk a little bit more about, you know, some of the really interesting things that are going on at, at in medicine, particularly around cell and gene therapy. Yeah. I mean, I- innovation is in our DNA. We were founded by one of the great inventors in the world, Ben Franklin, and we try to carry that through. I try to use innovation of, yeah, we're doing it this way and it's working, but why would we want to keep doing it that way? There's always a better way of doing it. And, you know, we talk about innovating in everything we do. We have great examples on the science side. The first approved uh, uh, gene and cell therapy in the United States based on, on uh, uh, Penn uh, uh, IP. Uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are based upon Penn IP. So we, we think innovation is big I, is how do we have an impact for good across the globe? Little I might be how do we make a monotonous job more exciting, more fulfilling for the employees so that they want to come to work. And we're constantly pushing what new tools could we use uh, to, to innovate the delivery system. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think my takeaway is it's a, a state of mind, right? That for you and your leadership team and, and as part of the culture, what you are looking to, to push through the organization and, and everyone, regardless of how big or small the task or how big or small the role is, is always looking to innovate and, and push forward. Yeah. I think um, if I could just expand on that a little bit, uh, we do the Penn Medicine Book Club, and one of, one of our speakers was Katie Milkman, who's an MIT-trained engineer who does behavioral economics at Wharton. And, and her book, uh, How to Change, one of the chapters is The Human Mind is Lazy. Like you get used to doing things the same way over and over and over again. And change is hard because the brain gets wired to doing it that way. How many times have we talked about, here comes management with another campaign, you know, it's another, and if we just wait it out, it'll go away. As opposed to if innovation can be an activity in daily living, you know, you're gonna rewire your brain to not think about the way we were doing it, but the way we could do it. Not not, not the way we always have, but the way it should be. And and I, I, I just think it, it makes for a, a more energetic uh, work environment uh, moving forward. And that, I think that's important. Um, it's because it's so hard right now. There, there has to be some giddy up that, that makes you want to come to work. I, I've got to ask you, go a little bit deeper on, on cell and gene therapy. I mean, you know, the, the Philadelphia is, you know, has kind of, you know, coined the term largely because of Penn Medicine of, you know, silicone, you know, silicone Valley and, and, you know, the amount of innovation that's occurring within, your city broadly and within your institution specifically is just is is amazing. Would love to hear just your take on on that at a high level, and then you know more specifically how you think that that innovation will actually change the delivery of medicine over the coming years. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it's a great question, one that we're we're, we're quite proud of. I, I think one of the reasons we've been able to move that forward here is based on uh, two things. One is the way we're structured, about 60% of the health system's margin helps to fund our research mission. So when people show up and they have ideas that are um, not fully baked, 1999, Carl June showed up on this campus. He had an idea of re-engineering people's T cells, reinserting uh, those T cells into a body using the AIDS virus, and that this would kill cancer. Anyone who says they knew he was onto something is lying. We thought he was as crazy as they come because, and he couldn't get federal grants through philanthropy and support from the health system. He was able to build that idea so that in 2010, he he published his Sentinel paper on it worked. And and that then allowed us to spin off companies, do licensing agreements with Novartis and other big pharma. And the, the, the second part that did is once you have a talented individual, more talent comes. You know, it's a magnet. And, and that innovation cluster of cell and gene therapy is happening here. You know, tech is certainly out, out in Palo Alto because Steve Jobs and 
Moore and all the rest of the guys, uh, you know, they, they clustered together and that. So Carl June, Jim Wilson, Gene Bennett, our colleagues at CHOP at Steve Grupp, like they, they have this innovation cluster and it just keeps attracting more talent in, into Philadelphia. Then the VC money follows, you know, we, we, we've funded about 15 uh, startup companies and they're all doing great. Most have uh, uh, converted to uh, public um, uh, and they're located here in Philadelphia. So that, that cell and gene vortex, uh, I, I think will continue unabated in, in Philadelphia as we move forward. Um, it goes back to what you mentioned about innovation, but the other part about leadership is talent acquisition, not necessarily people that fit the widget, but the, you, you know, the, um, the, the innovator, the, the, um, the people who think about ideas that nobody else is thinking about and giving them the freedom to uh, pursue it. Uh, Dr. Weissman and Dr. Carrico on, on the uh, messenger RNA would be another example of people that showed up about 23 years ago. Who knew when they showed up at Penn that they would, you know, perhaps save, save the world through the, the vaccine uh, process. So again, it's, that innovation cluster that makes it so exciting. And, and I do think it'll change the world going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Sickle cell is another where there's been really- Thank you. Know, you. Uh, um, no, I, but, I, I agree completely, yeah. When, when, but the other thing that is fascinating and, and fun to be part of, so Dr. June has remarkable ideas. And then the young guy comes along and says, I have a better idea. Like they all want to beat the master. And Dr. Weissman comes along and says, I don't think we're doing it the right way. We should use messenger RNA. One shot, I'll be able to cure sickle cell uh, anemia. And, you know, it, that friendly competition, uh, you know, um, it just elevates everybody's game. Well, we'd love to shift gears, you know, a little bit, Kevin, and, and talk about, you know, back to leadership, which is a focus of, of the Gary Bisbee show and, and talk about, you know, leadership, Let's call it outside of the you know the campus, outside of the the four walls of of Penn Medicine. How you think about the role of your organization in in the community? How you think about you know health equity and, and other you know social determinants is a, is a buzzword, but it's been you know social issues impacting healthcare is not is not new. Um, would love to hear you know your thoughts on on that and how you think about you know the, the responsibility of an organization such as yours and how you think about that as as a leader. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm going to give you a very personal answer, which is we're tax exempt, we're nonprofit, and we should live that every day. And it shouldn't be hard if someone says to you, why don't you pay taxes? You ought to be able to rattle it off. And, and at Penn, I believe we can do that, whether it's $50 million at Lancaster General to eliminate lead paint in the city of Lancaster hundred million dollars from Penn to eliminate asbestos from uh, the school buildings, uh, starting uh, our fund for health, which capitalizes companies that work on social determinants of health. An example, our most recent one, 28 health is a social, um, a digital platform for uh, reproductive rights. Like I, I think we need to live and own the fact that we have a privileged position in the United States, which is we're tax exempt. And, and we need to earn that. And I, I think it's something that we, as a health system writ large, in, including Penn, but everybody, we need to do a better job of demonstrating why we deserve that, that privilege. And as you said, there are a lot of buzzwords out there right now, health equity, social, we, we know what the issues are, we have to tackle them. And, and, and we need to tackle them in, in a hurry, or we may, cure people of cancer, but the civil unrest, the, the, the separation between the haves and the have nots will continue and it will not be a happy world. So I encourage all, all of the healthcare leaders listening, particularly from nonprofits that, you know, let, let's earn our tax exemption day in and day out. Yeah. Well, and in many ways you, you are um, the hub of that, you know, of kind of where all of those cross currents come together. I mean, members from the community, you know, of all different socioeconomic status, all different, you know, 
ethnic, you know, racial backgrounds, they, they come to your organization and to, to health systems across the country. I mean, the health systems have a very unique position of being kind of a hub of, of many, if not all of the different, you know, kind of societal cross currents. And, and how do you take that and, and, you know, utilize that and, and show, you know, connectivity to all the different spokes. If you're the hub, there, there are a lot of spokes and how do you, you know, how do you kind of take that role as a hub and, and be a, a real contributor? Yeah. I, I, you know, I think a big part, Nathan, is intentional leadership versus check the box. And, you know, we saw a lot of pledges after George Floyd's murder, a lot of people, but two, two plus years later, are you intentional every day in, in trying to close those health, health equity issues that we're facing? working with payers, working with community, working with each other, working with our um, collaborate, you know, uh, so in Philadelphia, together with Blue Cross and the major health systems, we put together Accelerate Health Equity because no, no one of us should own it. No, nobody should take out a billboard saying, uh, I'm doing more to eliminate health equity than Temple. It's something as regional leaders we should be doing together. And, and um, I think the the framework we have in Philadelphia is helping us get there. The final question I want to, to ask you, your final final topic is uh, is just about you know the importance of of the next generation of leaders. And you're you're a teaching institution. Co core to your mission is is training you know new physician and more broadly than physicians, clinical leaders you know more more broadly. So we'd love to hear your your thoughts on that and how you think about that that part of your mission. Yeah. So uh, the, the first thing I would say is we, we need to learn the hospital is not the center of the healthcare delivery system. And we need to learn as an industry how to meet the patient where they are. And increasingly that's virtual. And if we're not working towards those tools, you know, forget about it. So I, I think some of the competencies that we need, I, I, I talk about cyborg operations, which is some things will always be physical but a lot is gonna be handled virtually, handled in a different way, handled at home, handled in the clinic. And, and how do we meld those together so it's not siloed, but one longitudinal system. Cyborg operations, AI, one of my favorite topics is reverse logistics. And, and again, we're used to patients driving to us, finding a parking spot, sitting in the waiting room, and. And how do we be more like Amazon where we have to get product in a person to somebody's house? And, and, and how do we do that? How, how do we get the next generation of physician leaders comfortable with, with monitoring seven patients remotely for diabetes as opposed to one in their, uh, in, in their waiting room? The other two things that are really critical as a teaching organization particularly around physicians and um, uh, our, our employees in, in the future, is we, we always taught be tough, be resilient, muscle through it. You know, that was the hallmark of a, a physician. You know, when I was an intern, you know, I, I didn't go home for a year. Like, you know, I saw patients and I never slept. We have to park that mindset as that that's an ideal to you shouldn't have to be a tough guy to be in healthcare. You shouldn't have to, resilience is a, a great trait, but it shouldn't be something we have to teach you so you can survive. We, we, we should change the system. Well, Kevin, first of all, thanks for, for being you know, a, a guest here on the Gary Bisbee Show. More importantly, thanks for all the work that you do you know, in, in your community in, in the Philadelphia area, but, but beyond with the, the positions you're teaching and the, the innovations that, um, that you're fostering. So we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to, uh, to speak with us today. Thank you, Nathan.